So <coughs> there we go again for round table number four. Hope the lunch was fine. Everything was good. Yes. I'm, I'm always stunned to see at one point people trust more Facebook than governments. I'm always, you know, it's what we were talking about before, and it's always the same. But whatever. That's maybe the problem of politicians, number one problem, you know, trust before Facebook at some point. So, roundtable number four, uh, the fourth pillar of competitivity, which is a, a serious one, very important one, uh, building public-private partnerships. Uh, I remember this, uh, this image you were talking about, Arthur, about the cycling race. Huh? Is that correct? Huh? If you want to ride fast, you need three things, a good bike, a good shape, and smooth and fast road. The cyclist is the private sector, the bike is the government, and the road includes both physical and intangible infrastructures of economy. So this is what we're going to be talking about with our panel. Uh, with us uh, today, the pleasure to have uh, Her Excellency Ayman El Mutairi, which is Assistant Minister for Her Excellency Minister of Commerce and Investment of Saudi Arabia. Most welcome, Jason Shu, Member of Parliament in Taiwan, and Yanis Stornaras, Governor of the Bank of Greece, former Minister of Finance in Greece. Thanks for you to be here and to moderate this panel, Didier Cossin. Uh, Didier Cossin is Professor and Founder and Director of the IMD Global Board Center, between other things, among other things, the floor is yours, Didier. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, public private is certainly one of the main challenges for governance in the world today. We are in a world where, of course, your social disruptions, technological evolution, economic challenges are a threat to the well being of our societies. And it's very clear that the past model of separation, private, public, has not done very well. And private enterprises have been successful by themselves because of their efficiency, because of the entrepreneurship that they foster, but they have not achieved social improvements that we would like to see. At the same time, governments are certainly trying to tackle you know, their social environments, but often are held up by either a bureaucratic system or a highly conservative one that does not drive the value creation across the world that we would like to see. And so it is very pertinent that SDG number 17 is public-private partnership. Uh, but uh, is partnership possible? Is partnership a misnomer when you talk private and public? Because clearly the powers at stake are very different. From one side, capital markets, private owners with their own objectives which not, are not quite centrally towards social evolution. Uh, let's be very blunt, right? And on the other side, governments that uh, sometimes are highly responsible to their people and sometimes have their own interests and are a bit further away. So this is a challenge. There is no question that that challenge is part of our social evolution. We all know that the separation, the Milton Friedman's views, the greed is good view, is something of the past that will not work in the future. We all know that the profitability of businesses will be challenged if social evolution is not taken into account. And that stewardship, the ability to look into the long term and have positive social impact, will be one of the driver of our social success, economic success, and I would argue technological success of the future as well. So it is actually a great panel that we have for this uh, session, highly diverse, with three countries that in my view represent almost three angles of that problem. Uh, one country, Saudi Arabia, which is in the midst of uh, an enormous transformation. And the only fact that we have uh, a leading woman talk to us about the huge transformations going in her country is a sign that is very telling. We will have also Taiwan, one of the tech leaders of the world, 
to give us a different view of uh, PPP, because after all, it's not only infrastructure projects, it's deeper than that, and there is a tech dimension to it. And then we have a country that is potentially engaging on its renewal, a country that has suffered, and where public-private partnership may have meant in the past for government to get rid of its cost towards the private sector, and in the future, hopefully, is creating a new way of creating wealth and well-being in its own society. So, Eman, I would like to start with you. Can you tell us a bit more about the Saudi Arabian context and your view of PPP in the Saudi Arabian context? Thank you, Didier, and thank you, everybody, for hosting us. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as was just mentioned a minute ago, it gives me goosebumps to be here as a leader in my country. One day, women were not allowed to go out or travel alone or drive their cars or guide and lead such a transformation. So I'm honored, I'm very happy, uh, I'm very excited. Things are happening in Saudi Arabia. We have talked about our vision for the past three years. We've talked about some goals that we want to achieve. We want to be a thriving economy. Uh, we want to be an ambitious nation. We are getting there. We are already seeing some of the results of our plans, and one of which is the PPP. Uh, the vision of Saudi Arabia started in 2016, and it had so many um, different elements of uh, projects that we wanted to, to uh, uh, leapfrog and go about. They're not only economic projects, but they're also social projects. Uh, we have 13 vision realization programs, and these programs mean that they cross over all government sectors, not only um, uh, identified in one entity or government entity or one ministry. And the reason being is we want all the government to collaborate with each other and work towards one goal. One of the vision realization programs is the privatization program of Saudi Arabia. And what we have done actually is worked with all ministries to identify opportunities for privatization. And what we also have done is we made sure that there is the regulatory system that protects all these projects for the private sector. So Our privatization within their own ministries, so meaning scaling down their activities? Yes. So the government wants to work as a regulator and spin off and outsource a lot of the services that they're providing to the private sector for many reasons. For efficiency reasons, for scaling up reasons, and for improving the private sector in Saudi Arabia. The private sector in Saudi Arabia is a very young sector. And one way to actually enhance it and enlarge it is by doing such projects with the government. So it's so that's a very one thing. powerful government that's actually shrinking itself. That's right, yes. And for that to happen, they have to build the right regulations and the legislative framework around this. They will support them by the right regulations. They will support them with the funds. They will support them with the opportunities. So the opportunities have been identified, not only with the government sector entities, but also with the giga projects that the government is going about. Yeah, giga projects. Mega projects, not enough, right? We are talking giga projects. They Can are giga projects. About OK, giga, giga projects. projects. We, we talked about, uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, you have heard about Neom. Neom is a new city a city that is going to be a revolutionary city. It's, it's the fourth industrial revolution city. It's an industrial and, and tourism. We have the sun and the sand um, and in the sea just in one place. So we are developing it from scratch. It's a beautiful location. I encourage you all to come and visit one day. And this is a huge opportunity for the private sector to come and invest, whether it is local or foreign investment. And this city is going to unleash the potential, unlock all the uh, requirements and the guidelines that were restricting the private sector uh, previously in Saudi Arabia to give that massive opportunity for investors. One other thing that I want to touch on, because yes, I am the assistant minister for the Minister of Commerce and Investment, but I'm also heading the National Competitiveness Center of Saudi Arabia. 
And the reason this was established initially before anything, this has started actually as a committee with 40 government entities working uh, together with the private sector to identify all the challenges that the private sector is, uh, is facing and making sure that we cut all the red tapes. It started as a committee and then it was institutionalized beginning of this year as the National Competitiveness Center. And the reason why we've done that is we realize for us to grow with our giga projects or to uh, expand on the private uh, sector opportunities, we have to cut down a lot of the bureaucracy. So we're killing all the bureaucracy in, in this committee and in this center. And actually Saudi Arabia can pass laws in six weeks. And I'll talk more maybe a little bit about that later on. So I just want to give the opportunity for my colleagues to say more about them. Excellent, excellent. Jason, uh, let's move to the tech world uh, a bit. And how do you see PPP in the tech dimension? Yeah, so uh, truth be told, I was a tech entrepreneur before becoming a politician. So when I, when I joined the parliament, my friends joked that I joined the dark side. Uh, but I feel in this day and age, we need people who can speak the language of both worlds, the world of public policy and the world of uh, technology. So I made it my mission in the parliament to remove any legal barrier for technology and uh, innovation. So there are a few things that I look at, the really uh, newly reformed PPP concept. Uh, I'll use a few examples uh, that I am uh, initiating in Taiwan. Uh, there are several laws that I drafted and passed, uh, including Autonomous Vehicle um, Management Act, Cybersecurity Management Act, uh, Cryptocurrency Law, and as well as the most recently, I uh, just uh, published the uh, Artificial, uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, Principle Law. These are the things that are really giving birth to the new industry. Uh, instead of looking at traditional infrastructure projects like building roads, bridges, or, or buildings and stuff like that, we look at PPP as a way to give birth to new industries. So if you look at the three things that I mentioned, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and um, 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 uh, autonomous vehicles, this has to do with the original pillar of strength that Taiwan built upon, which is semiconductor and IC chip design. Taiwan bet on something 30 years ago, which is a semiconductor. And when, semi when TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, was built in 1970, we had a vision of becoming the critical component of everything you use in a digital life, and which now today is obviously your semiconductor chip. And now with the uh, autonomous vehicles, with the new cybersecurity industry, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and as well as artificial intelligence, we are creating new type of PPP projects that allow entrepreneurs to get engaged with the government procurement um, um, uh, projects to allow the new industry to be born. So, so that's how we look at the PPP uh, in today's Jason, uh, uh, digital Jason, I understand age. you as a crypto congressman yeah. of your parliament. Uh, but I'd like to come back to what Fatih was saying earlier today, where he said that in Switzerland, we don't have any central organization. And after all, on crypto, Switzerland is one of the largest centers of the world, with Zug and uh, the crypto valley over there. So what's your feeling, what, you know, what's going on there? Do we need the public? Do we need the, the P or is it a small P for public and a big P for private or how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, most of the laws today are written in a pre-internet age, but most of the, the, the services and products and devices we use are created uh, upon the dawn of internet. So the laws today are really, really outdated and antiquated. So, for example, uh, how do you regulate crypto? You know, how do you classify it as a new asset class? Is it a currency? Is it an asset? And what it is, how do you tax it, right? And so in Taiwan, I, we created something we call a uh, uh, sandbox. Uh, we employed and implement FinTech sandbox, which, are, which is a regulatory uh, exemption to allow FinTech startups to operate within the, uh, the, the, the testing period without the legal liability. So a lot of startups are attracted to Taiwan because of our legal uh, flexibility, uh, which I believe would be the new type of uh, competitiveness component to look at, uh, which is the uh, regulatory innovation. 
And so for this type of things that we are also expanding to new areas that is being disrupted by the digital uh, economy. For example, medical services and the uh, uh, digital health er uh, uh, era. Uh, for example, how do you uh, regulate the use of the data? And how do you make sure that the, the data that is being used is being used in a good way and also to advance the uh, medical research and the uh, cancer prevention? So these are the type of things we think that would allow uh, new projects and a new industry to be born and encouraged. Thank you, Jason. Yanis, you were the Minister of Finance during tough times in your country. Uh, you are now the governor of the central bank of what could be a new Greece that we are all hoping towards a new development. How do you see PPP in that environment? Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, you have created a very good business school, from what I can see. It is the first time that I visit you. Um, you rightly pointed out that uh, Greece suffered a lot in the previous years, um, but it managed to, to turn the economy. It, was, it, it is an excellent turnaround case. Uh, few people believe that Greece would make it in the beginning of the crisis, but it managed to turn um, huge gigantic twin deficits into twin surpluses to uh, improve unit labor, unit labor cost competitiveness, but not so much structural competitiveness as you have um, in your IMD report. That's right. Um, uh, and there, I, I will come back to that because uh, it's a problem, but also it is an opportunity because being uh, so low in the ranking, you can jump high if you can, if you can follow the right policies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can. Um, so um, we have overcome many of the problems of the crisis, but of course there are uh, legacy problems like um, high public debt, despite the fact that with the assistance of our um, Eurogroup uh, peers, uh, we have managed to keep the servicing of this debt at a very uh, low level for a very uh, long number of years. Of course, we have non-performing loans in the banks as a legacy of the crisis. And beware here, um, the cause of the crisis in Greece was not the banking sector, as in many other distressed, right. financially distressed countries. It was the state uh, which failed and passed on the problem to the banks. So um, banks um, have been contaminated by, by the failure of the state, unfortunately. Um, Anyway, the banking sector has been recapitalized three times, have been consolidated. We used to have 17 systemic banks. We only have four now. So you can imagine, um, uh, you can imagine the effort uh, that has been, has been devoted. Um, and thus, public-private during these times was mostly transfer from the public towards the private to save costs. We had, yes, exactly. Uh, I, this is exactly, I want to come now to the um, um, uh, PPP, to the public-private right. partnership. During the crisis, um, we developed a PPP project as a way to minimize uh, the budget cost. So to reduce the cost of public investment by transferring some of the risk to the private sector. So that was uh, the, initial con the initial concept. But um, during time, um, it, um, it acquired many more properties. For instance, um, the private sector could do certain things better than, than, than the, the, the public sector. So now we have moved from, um, from a cause which was to, to save money for the budget to a cause which, uh, which is much, much wider and has to do with the incorporation of the private sector into uh, the new growth model of the Greek economy. And this is where we are now. So there are about uh, 14 rather small uh, PPP projects uh, going from waste management to telematics in transport to broadband connection in uh, rural areas, very poor ones, or in the border. But uh, it's about 40, it covers 45% of the population. But now we move to mega projects. Um, for instance, the new Elinicon project uh, is, a, uh, is a development project which has to do with development uh, of uh, villas, um, offices, uh, very luxurious hotels, and a casino in the old area of uh, 
the airport of Athens, mm -hmm. uh, which is three times as large as Monaco, where we can create the new Riviera of the Eastern Medi Med Mediterranean. This is a PPP project because uh, it is the state, which for historical reasons in Greece owns a lot of land. Mm -hmm. I can explain to you why. Um, which has, has remained totally undeveloped. It is, written, it, it is at a zero value in, in the books of the state. So it presents a huge opportunity, which is totally unexploited. It's only now we, are, we, we realize how important it is to create PPPs using um, the, st the state land as a catalyst to, to attract private foreign investment. Uh, so this, this project is, uh, is one example of, uh, of creating um, a new development model in the suburbs of Athens, uh, so close to a, the sea. It's a value creative project Absolutely. versus a value transfers that we saw maybe it before. It is both. It is both. Mm -hmm. But this is only one example. I, I can tell you another one. For instance, um, in Greece, we have a characteristic where the medical profession is of a very high level. So during the crisis, many good doctors left Greece and they went to Germany, to Australia, to the United States, to the United Kingdom. Uh, also, um, uh, we, we have very good hospitals in Greece, some of them with excess capacity. So why, instead of exporting doctors, not importing people um, from abroad with, uh, with chronic illnesses, that they can use uh, the excess capacity of hospitals as rehabilitation centers? This is an excellent example. Um, uh, obviously, of a PPP you know, I'm, uh, in medicine. So you're you're going to have a new you have a new government. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I hope, and we all hope, that uh, trust in uh, government efficiency and the right objectives and the right stewardship is going to take off. But isn't there a real threat to public-private partnership of simply having ineffective governments trying to free ride a bit of entrepreneurship without truly creating value and, and the entrepreneurs within the game that at the end, you know, don't gain that much, are exhausted and have just, you know, uh, given help to a bureaucratic system that does not drive real success. Good point. First of all, uh, it's true that we have now a new government, a liberal one, which was elected on the 7th of July, which believes very much in the private sector, in privatization, in structural reform. That's why I'm sure that uh, next year um, in your list, Greece uh, will jump high. Um, so please, please put, put this down in your, in your diary. <laughs> um, first of all, um, uh, um, there is a government which believes now in the private sector, in, in, in PPPs as a value, as a value creating vehicle. Um, second, we have very skilled labor force, despite the brain drain, which was one of the biggest problems of the crisis. I mean, we overcame the problem of deficits, of competitiveness, but the brain, the brain drain is a serious problem. We, we lost one of the, the, the we lost the, the best brains of the country, but despite that, even, even the labor force, which is has remained, and the, and the, and the scientists, uh, they are still produce um, scientific publications with citations, which is one of the highest in the world. So wh wh we, we don't lack ideas. We lack private capital to take these ideas and make them innovations. So this is another area where uh, we can have PPPs between universities, research centers, and the private sector. So, so like we to... don't think that, um, yeah, very, very. on the contrary, it will be a value creating rather than a value distracting. Of course, you're right, we must have an infrastructure, an institutional framework where we can design, the state mm -hmm. can design, that is create, manage, evaluate, and monitor mm -hmm. all these projects. This is extremely important. So I would like to ask you all one question. Would it be acceptable in our, your societies that are very different societies, would it be acceptable to have a private individual organization within the PPP system that becomes a billionaire and out of PPP makes true wealth? Would that be acceptable in Saudi Arabia, in the kingdom? Um, I believe if they're efficient and they can deliver on the targets of the kingdom and the transformation ambitions, why not? We are not there to unlock them. We're, here to, to, we're not here to lock them. We're here to unlock them and unleash that potential. So by all means, a very strong private sector means a very strong economy and a very strong country. 
Absolutely. There has to be very good uh, regulations and regulatory framework. The government has to regulate and fund. That's the first power. The second power is the competitive markets. And the, th and the last power that we did not talk about and we didn't touch on is the NGOs. They have to also play with, with the, the PPP. So that is very important and we have to pay attention to. For the competitive market, you have to think about innovations. You have to think about uh, social innovations, social entrepreneurships. That, those create jobs. And that, that makes the economy flourish by time. So Excellent. absolutely, yes. So bringing in other parties and, and true competitive markets absolutely. and NGOs, other stakeholders, yes. to make sure the billionaire has not made a billion out of arrangements or anything like that, but is truly creating value. Absolutely. That's much beyond the wealth made, actually. Absolutely. A value that is uh, very crucial for the, for the society, for the community, for the social in general, not only econ economy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jason, can you get uh, an AI billionaire out of one of your AI infrastructure projects? Yeah, I think clearly it's, it's an issue of how procurement law is written in each country. And obviously, 30, uh, 20, 30 years ago, when the country needed um, the input or contribution for private sector, we uh, purposely recruit a lot of uh, uh, private companies to help build up the infrastructure and the new um, uh, public uh, roads and the uh, railway and stuff like that. But, but now I feel right now that procurement law that was used 30 years ago is still being used today, but which is not applied to the um, constant change of today's new uh, technology or new business model. So what I wanted to point out is that uh, we need to find a way to encourage our public servants to take risks and to innovate. Because a lot of the public servants are somewhat stuck in between the rigid laws and the ways that they wanted to implement their ideas. So we don't really rule out anyone, uh, even you are a billionaire or you are a you know, 30 year old, 20 year old entrepreneur who wanted to participate in a PPP. As long as you show and demonstrate your capability and you are encouraged to be evaluated in the same way and on the same fashion that is being evaluated across the board. And is, do you think that would be socially acceptable in Greece? Well, as you know, uh, Greece belongs to the uh, Eurozone, to the uh, European economy. Uh, the institutional environment is very strict. You cannot become a billionaire out of, uh, out of nothing. Um, there are so many checks and balances. Sometimes, on the contrary, we believe that bureaucracy and uh, excess regulation kills entrepreneurship. We, we don't want that. And they, they, the new government will take care of that, that people that are in, involved in, in these projects will earn a normal a normal profit, not of course normal profits, but they will not lose their money. Um, so there are going to be a stable tax environment uh, and um, less bureaucracy, less red tape. In fact, the new government, in one month, it removed all the impediments to this uh, investment in Elinico. As you know, in Greece, uh, one of the strongest services due to, to history is the archaeological service. And uh, unless you have specific requirements uh, the archaeological service can intervene and stop a lot of public works. Um, we've managed to, to do the Olympic Games through special legislation. And uh, of course, um, we, um, um, we have shown the wealth of ancient Greece, not by preventing development and growth, but by revealing all these uh, uh, treasures from ancient times and putting side by side, for instance, in the new metro stations, in, in, the, in, the, in the metro stations. Uh, next to the stations, you have um, fantastic um, uh, small libraries where we exhibit um, ancient findings. Uh, so the same can, can happen with Elinico now. So that, this was not the reason, not the project to, to uh, uh, take place. Uh, we simply needed uh, a new kind of regulation to allow the project, but of course with respect to our um, cultural heritage and uh, for those for those of you or for those of us that are from the private sector it's been hard to believe that governments can be so dynamic and energetic and and not stuck somehow I and mean, clearly you have lived through a huge transformation with your leader his royal highness 
I hear having WhatsApp groups with ministers so that he can tell them directly what to do real time with the private sector as well. You were mentioning clearly a country that has recognized the first robot citizen, is that right? Yeah, last year, that, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that is opening to tourism, so that is transforming, you know, every week we hear some news. Uh, is this, is this going to be the key driver to PPP success? Or, or are you fearing almost the opposite, that the private sector is not dynamic enough? Actually, uh, you're absolutely right on the first one. The private sector will be dynamic if we allow them and enable them to be dynamic. So the legal framework, the structure has to be there. So what we have done in the past uh, two years, we've actually reviewed all our laws and, um, and uh, policies. We have uh, created the commercial pledge law. We have created the insolvency law. We have, we're nearly finishing now the um, investment law. Uh, we have just finished reviewing totally the uh, procurement law. This is the infrastructure that the private sector needs to know, f to know that they can actually prosper and they can be protected. Um, and they, know, they, they need to know their rights and their responsibilities, just like the government needs to, to know to, to give them that. So they are going to be, definitely they are, they're being uh, given the opportunity, they've been given the support from the highest uh, level of authority in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Crown Prince is leading the, the vision. This is the vision that we have put together with him and with, with the support of all the government entities and the private sector. Saudi, the government of Saudi Arabia used to work alone. We used to create a lot of laws and, and legislations and policies, and we thought that, yeah, that would be accepted uh, to the private sector, but we forgot to ask the private sector. What happened recently is actually we, don't, we do not uh, issue any law until we send it for public consultation. This is actually a, uh, a royal decree. So we send first for public consultation on a website, very clear, very transparent. We take all the feedback. We, we take in whatever the private sector tells us if they all agree on at least 80% of the changes and we make the changes and then we issue the law. We no longer issue the law alone. Now, did that work? Are we, are we being more competitive? Absolutely. And uh, that is witnessed by the IMD report. Saudi Arabia have jumped for the first time 13 places up. It's the biggest jump globally. So thank you very much for recognizing our competitiveness. Uh, we're also working, we have a lot of partners who we work with personally, I work with in the uh, National Competitiveness Center. The World Bank is also another partner that we work with. These international organizations have helped us uh, understand what methodology we need to use. How do we set targets? How do we learn from the best practices? So we don't start from scratch. Now, I think we're leapfrogging, so we've learned everything from them, but we've created some more initiatives and some more targets for ourselves. And we're being very harsh on ourselves because we know we can do it. There is no reason for Saudi Arabia not to work and, and get to the targets that, the, that we need to get to, because we have all the resources, we have the support, which is very important, and we're moving very rapidly. The only problem is the world is not recognizing how fast we can move. So they're calling us an outlier right now, okay? Because we, we're spiking in all the changes that we have made. Right. Uh, we, make, we make changes to our laws in, in less than one month. If you allow me, I just want to talk about something very, very personal and very important, I think, to the world. It's how we empowered women. And we empowered women not because of, of human rights issues only. However, we empowered them because they are half of the society. 50% of our society are women and 70% of our society are young generation. If we don't empower our women and our talent, we will never be competitive enough. We will never be able to grow our economy. And that's the only reason why we're doing it. And there are lots of females that actually are leapfrogging as entrepreneurs. We have availed the opportunity. We, have, we, don't, we don't like to use the word empower, but we want to give them equal opportunity as men. And so they can play in the same field the same way they, they deserve. And they actually have done so well, not only in, in science and in technology, but also in leadership. We have very, very good leaders in Saudi Arabia. We have changed all the laws uh, that discriminates between men and women in Saudi Arabia in less than six weeks. And everything was already announced and the laws were passed uh, end of September. 
of uh, this year. So now women can travel uh, alone without a guardianship approval. They can issue their own passports. They can, you can drive, you can see my, it's very actually, it touches the hearts of every woman when you see a keychain of your car hanging from your, your bag, something that everyone thought at some point it is not going to happen ever. The rest of the uh, world thought it was something normal. For Saudi Arabia, it gives us all goosebumps every time I look into my bag and I see my car keys there. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, public-private partnership. Partnership, is this a misnomer? Is this possible? Do we have governments that are dynamic enough to create public-private partnerships that are truly transformative to our societies? What do you think? What do you think? Uh, please uh, feel free to ask us questions. You know, this is open to the floor. But before we go to one of your questions, Jason, you are the tech congressman, but you were also behind the law on uh, marriage equality yeah. uh, in Taiwan. Uh, is there a link? Uh, no, but <laughs> no, there, there's indeed a uh, linkage to digital equality, which is also a human rights uh, issue. Uh, Taiwan becomes the first uh, country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage in May, uh, 20, uh, in May 17, 2019. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of the uh, 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 sponsors of the law and legislation. And reason why I believe that in today's digital sovereignty and today's human rights that we do so much with uh, internet and, and social media that we need to redefine our digital footprint. And the way we define our digital ownership online is how we treat our property and our assets for the future. For example, when I look at cryptocurrency and how something like Libra was created and it was brought um, before the, the US Congress for testimony and obviously Politics is always very slow in catching up with the new technology, a new way of uh, disrupting the incumbent order. Um, so I think a lot of these things uh, show that you need to look at pre rather than mainstream for innovation. And blockchain, for example, we are now implementing a new national digital ID, which we will consolidate our social security data, our healthcare data, and our um, all data consolidated on this digital key that allow you to use it uh, with your own permission. So I think a lot of these things have to do with how we manage our, our lifestyle and how we look at laws and ways with which that we can enable our, our uh, capabilities. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of uh, why I believe the new type of PPP can give birth to new industry. Now this is something that I created in the parliament in Taiwan called Indo-Pacific Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, next, next. Um, so we started with 17 countries uh, along with the uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific region and uh, the IT ministers come together to ask Taiwan to help them train their uh, cybersecurity professionals. Next. Next, thank you. Just really quickly, I think the, uh, uh, we are at the forefront of the cyber warfare. Uh, we are hit uh, 20 million to 30 million times every month. And very few of those attacks penetrated our system. But we realized that this is our weakness, but we need to harness our strength in IT and uh, engineers to develop a robust um, cybersecurity defense. So we developed and uh, work with the countries in the region to help them train and also build capacity and build Taiwan as a cybersecurity training center. Next. Next. Just really quickly, these are the countries that are participating and the countries that are mostly in the region and also in uh, uh, Pacific uh, islands that are working together and because we, we believe that with the cybersecurity, uh, it's more than just something you patch when problem uh, erupts. It's actually a new industry that you can foster uh, with a public and private uh, partnership. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, questions from the floor, or comments, or views? Please, yes. Right here in the front row. And uh, we'll have you, sir, after, just after. Do we have two mics? Uh, so you, if you can bring to the gentleman in the back right here, please. Hi, uh, Ian Stewart, former uh, founder of Wired Magazine. I, I just had a curious question for each of the representatives. Um, I noted that Elizabeth Warren came out publicly recently um, against uh, private ownership of prisons in the United States. Huh. Are there areas of... Prisons. Jails. A prison for uh, PPP. Uh, yeah. yeah, private uh, jails that are owned okay. privately. Yeah. Yeah. In the US. So I'm curious, are there areas within each of your governments that would not be acceptable to be run by the private sector? And I'm curious if they're different amongst the three countries. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. So what areas could not be PPP in your world? Um. We haven't actually, personally in Saudi Arabia, we did not receive any formal uh, um, circular or information that this is not to be touched by the private sector. Uh, I can't think of any, to be honest. Maybe there is some for the local, uh, sorry, for the international private sector, for FDI. We have the negative list like any other country. But for the local, no, there isn't any. Well, uh, I would say uh, where we have purely public goods, like uh, justice, justice cannot be private, like, uh, like prisons, prisons cannot be private, like uh, army, you cannot have a private army, like police, you can't have a private, of course, I, I'm not talking about, about uh, uh, security, private security. Uh, so uh, these are the areas where in a European country it's not acceptable um, to, have a, uh, to have a private participation. But apart from that, all other areas, even those have been taboo up to now, um, could be uh, could could have uh, uh, PPPs. It's a great like question to sharpen what's a public good sure. and uh, what could be well, private uh, benefits. Huh? I will tell you. Uh, I mean, an example. Many people. I mean, the the Bank of Greece is one of the three central banks in the world that they are listed in the stock market. Uh. So many uh, many uh, um, <laughs> private shareholders in the general assembly of the of the central bank say, why don't you distribute all the profits uh, <laughs> to the private shareholders? I mean, I said, because monetary policy is a public good. It's a historical paradox that the Bank of Greece is listed in the stock market, but that doesn't mean that private shareholders um, should, should get all the, all the um, um, profits from monetary policy. And uh, so, uh, as you know, uh, it is uh, the Bank of Greece, it's the Bank of Belgium, and the Bank of Japan, if I'm right that we, we, are, we Swiss, are listed, uh, Swiss and, and the Swiss well. uh, National Bank as well. So we, the governments have passed a golden, golden rule um, um, shareholdings that uh, about 90% of the profits go as dividend to the state, despite the fact that uh, uh, private shareholders in Greece are, about, uh, are more, more than 50% in the central bank. So monetary policy is a public good, cannot be privatized, Jason. one example. Jason? Yeah, so we privatized uh, almost all of the utilities uh, businesses in Taiwan. But however, there's only one thing that I am arguing in the parliament that I wanted to be privatized as well, which is the uh, judicial system. I'm now studying the use of the AI judges to judge the, uh, uh, the older cases. <laughs> and, and I believe that would be the future of the new type of uh, uh, legal uh, proceedings that were would be uh, encouraged in a lot of ways, and the problem that exists today is that we are developing autonomous vehicles in Taiwan, and we are now allowing autonomous vehicle to run on the streets now. But we have no way to uh, judge when a uh, accident happened, and how do we rule the ethics behind the, the algorithm, and how how do we uh, hold the algorithm accountable? And judges today have no way of, of uh, really make the judgment on that. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Please, sir. Uh, my name is Kevin Holland. I've run businesses for a long time, and then also been a British diplomat in China for a few years. So I also worked on the privatization of dialysis services in Saudi Arabia. So I've got some perspective on this. And I kind of missed the Brits on the panels for the last few days, but I guess we're <laughs> busy back home for the next 27 days. 
But but I but I wanted to um, but I wanted to ask a question around really the success of private public partnerships, and I'm asking that because the UK has done it for many years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. We advanced in That's many right. things like building hospitals, transport infrastructure, and if you look at the kind of companies we've created, you know, Carillion, Capita, Circo, train services. In fact, many of them are not really economically competitive, and we've seen Carillion go bankrupt, Capita, which is a big outsourcing company, has come close to that. So in some cases, I've seen the country who's maybe done the longest public-private partnerships is perhaps turning back from it. And I think in the healthcare sector particularly, we'll move back away from public-private to more public-public. So I'd be interested in the panel's opinion on which are the sectors where they really believe you can be economically competitive and build sustainable partnerships long term? Because that's not always been our experience. So after 40 years of public-private partnership, it's better to take a public service train in Switzerland than one public-private one in the UK, right? How do you feel about that? Um, one of the projects that uh, Saudi Arabia is embarking on, on the PPP, is the water desalination. It's huge in Saudi Arabia. So that that's, uh, privatization project, project have just started. I'll let you know in a few years how successful it is. We're actually looking at a lot of projects in the healthcare uh, services, among others, in, in, as I said, in all government entities. We're doing uh, mostly a lot of outsourcing and spinning off of the government uh, businesses. But we're yet to see the results. We're still very, it's very early to decide whether it is successful or not. But hopefully with all the uh, laws that governs it and the um, evaluation as we go, we will be able to reach our targets. Uh, Eman, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a bit pointed in my question. Uh, but I think I will reflect uh, your question, which is many private companies in Saudi Arabia are not that effective and not that well governed. Uh, family businesses with difficulties and, and uh, what is the chance that if these companies become main actors of the public-private partnerships, you actually have a degradation or at least not a fulfillment of your ambitions there. You, you are right. Now, we started by saying that the private sector in Saudi Arabia is still new. You know, it's not very old, we're still, they're still learning. But one of the things, is, at least, that we've done this year is we've changed the company's law. We've, we've enhanced it because we know that there are some problems with some of the companies, not all. But we're learning. It's, I mean, something that we are, the government is trying to support the private sector by all means, by either uh, putting in better legislations, by putting in some uh, uh, better courts even, and, um, and, and uh, you know, in enhancing the uh, financing uh, system as well. And the funding, that is also something that they needed to work on. So with all of that put together, we are hoping that we will reach our target. We are, we are still new, we are still very young in the private sector, and there is a lot to learn. I'm sure we will make mistakes, but we have to start that journey. Excellent. Yanis, uh, is there a risk of degradation of the public services in Greece through public-private partnership? You said de degradation no, of, uh, I, I don't of think so. the services going down in quality because they are managed by short-term organizations that have profit in mind despite their being public goods. That no, because uh, as I said, uh, because the PPP will not go into in, into the heart of the state, so mm -hmm. it's uh, it it has to do with uh, with companies. Of course, corporate governance is extremely important, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is where um, during the crisis, um, along with reducing deficits and improving competitiveness, we tried to to improve the corporate governance of banks, for instance of uh, listed companies, not always with success. We had uh, examples of uh, mal malpractices we'll, 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 we'll try to, to minimize now. I, put, I, I, I give a lot of emphasis um, to the regulators, to the central banks, to capital markets com committees, to competition authorities. This is exactly where the state should invest now because mm -hmm. The private sector advances very quickly, and you cannot have public services lagging behind in expertise and in methodologies and in uh, infrastructure. Uh, because you cannot have uh, the private sector using uh, nuclear weapons and the, uh, the public sector using just rivals. Yeah, uh, we, 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 I mean, everybody we will lose. Up, yeah. Yeah. What do you think, sir? Are you getting an answer to your question? I, I think I still have a concern. Uh, still a concern, eh? Yeah. 
Sorry, part of the reason... A bit I louder. Think, yeah, see, I, I still have a concern, and, and having watched them long-term not necessarily work so successfully, I think part of the reason is some of the things we touched on yesterday, which is I really think that the mindset between public and private is completely different. And many of these projects, when they start, they come into it because the government sector wants to drive costs as low as we can, as low as we can, as we low as we can. And then companies who bid for them end up putting in models which are non-sustainable long-term. And that creates a real friction in how their ability is to operate afterwards. And I don't think we've really addressed that. Very good. Thank you. Can I just uh, if yeah. allow me just to answer this? You're absolutely right. But one of the things that at least we are trying to do in Saudi Arabia is change that mindset by changing the people. A lot of the people who are holding positions as ministers or the second and third layer in the government sector are coming from the private sector. So there are teams who have worked with us in our committees in the National Competitiveness Center from the private sector that they came with a lot of challenges and different models of running the business. We took those same people who had a lot of complaints and, and had a lot of suggestions, and we made them ministers. So we, we are now asking that they actually apply the model of the private sector in the government sector. It is one way of connecting the two together. But there are many other challenges, of and, course. And that we'll also, be I would with. argue, you're not looking into cost savings. You're really looking into dynamizing, uh, energizing Scaling the economy. Up and, of and, all, and right? Also, so we, have, we have an issue with the, with the talent and skills. So we are trying to bring it from the private sector until the, the government sector actually can build their capabilities. Please, uh, yes. This is actually... Um, yeah, yeah, it works. I don't know if it's working. Okay, so this was actually a follow-up comment to what Kevin once says, because one of the most obvious uh, private-public uh, systems we have is the U.S. healthcare system, uh, where literally every single physician is his own private contractor, uh, with the payers, and they might be, you know, private insurance, but quite often there are the Medicare and Medicaid services, which is governmentally owned in the U.S. The U.S. spends close to 20% of its GDP on healthcare, so it's not a good example of how you control cost by having a fee-for-service system where every physician, you know, some will be doing a really good job and not overuse resources, but many have in the past, and there have been many scandals of. Medicare fraud, where doctors have gone to jail for somewhere between six and 12 years for billing abuse and so on. These are things that we tend to see very little of in single payer, uh, say, state controlled healthcare systems, which may in turn suffer from some other issues of access to top care and so on. But it's a very, very delicate situation, particularly in healthcare, when you consider how much of that you want to lay in private hands, particularly when it comes to the care provision side. So, so my experience as a physician, which is my background, has been similar to some of the, the concerns that Kevin is voicing. I think we're seeing a little bit of a backlash against that model. Uh, so is healthcare testing the limits of public-private partnerships? Do you have a tech view of that, Jason? No. Um, so Taiwan actually has uh, 25 years of universal health care. And it's been debated numerous times in Parliament whether we should uh, privatize our healthcare uh, services, and it caused a lot of uh, um, debates as well. And uh, not, it has not been settled. So I think it's about the um, uh, users' behavior once they are accustomed to the way they are uh, being offered for the service. That it's hard for them to incentivize for the alternatives. So right now, it's very clear that all patients in Taiwan or all citizens in Taiwan are very easily abused in the system because it's so cheap uh, for, for the uh, universal health care. It's so easy for them to just to go to hospital and get free medicine almost. And that, so I think we are looking at the new ways to uh, look at uh, uh, encouragement for the citizens to stay healthy rather than go into hospital for uh, free medicine. Um, so it's, it's still an issue, yeah, hard to resolve. Reaction to that from your side? Well, Grace? in um, Greece, Greece uh, is a country where um, the health, uh, there's universal uh, health coverage uh, at a very, very low cost, even at no cost at all. Um, and also, uh, we have both pri private and, uh, and public, and public uh, health systems. Um, the social security system uh, covers everybody. Um, so the question now in Greece is how to incorporate um, some 
private, um, let's say, private management into, into public hospitals to minimize costs. Because this, it is not a question of coverage. Everybody in Greece um, has the best services available. But the question is how to minimize costs in public hospitals by introducing private, um, uh, private management in, in public hospitals. And the question is, what's the best way to do that? It's just appointing uh, managers from, from the private sector, giving public hospitals um, uh, a, 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 to, to the private sector a license to govern public hospitals under the auspices of, the gov of, uh, of government policies. So these are the kind of questions. So it's not a question of, of quality. It's a question of minimizing costs in Greece. Because there is the idea that there's a lot of waste. Uh, because if you don't price well, even, even a virtual system of pricing uh, medical, uh, medical operations, um, you create waste. So the question is, what, are, uh, what is the best way um, to, to price medical services for the social security system, which is all, also public? Uh, I mean, in Greece, we are the, the other side. Uh, we are all, almost 95% um, um, of the social security is pay as you go and public. So we definitely we need to introduce some um, capital elements in the uh, in the social security system. So what I'm what I'm learning from this uh, set of uh, questions is really that uh, PPP cannot be only about cost efficiency. Because if we are relying only on the business side for cost efficiency, of course, there will be some side effects. And business interests will be misaligned to the true values that should be behind PPP. And so it's really figuring out the purpose of PPP and where the entrepreneurship is combining well with uh, government and social objectives somehow. And, and having this in a, in a creative system, which means a bit of a reinvention of the governance of PPP within these. And uh, I think thank you for the UK examples and the, and the, and the difficulties that uh, have been there. And that should make us think about the future of PPP, which has to be quite, uh, quite different. Thank you. Any other question from uh, the room? Yes, yes, sir. My name is Abhijat. I'm an alumni of IMD. Uh, <clears throat> just picking on that conversation, I'm trying to, to think about the motivation for being such proponents of PPP now. So is it really the efficiency? Or is it a time when your governments are kind of struggling with finances? And this is probably the underlying motivation for trying to attract some of this investment. And uh, <clears throat> linked to that, how do you think about, uh, and you know, in a situation where laws can be changed by a royal decree, how does that give anybody the confidence that the partnership they're entering into is for the long term? And at the same time, and then talking both about Saudi Arabia and Taiwan, the players who can enter the market, what if they're playing with somebody who's not a friendly neighbor to you? Uh, Jason, I would like to start with you on uh, yeah. this one. I and mean, clearly for you, it's not only cost efficiency, right? There are other objectives. So can you tell us about that? And that final question of you know, how do you deal with less friendly countries? Yeah, that's a really obviously sensitive question that I, uh, we are dealing with right now. Uh, obviously, the uh, next phase of the, the US and China trade war is escalating to the, the high tech war. And Taiwan is at the very center of it. Uh, I'll tell you a figure that uh, 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 President Trump's sanction on Huawei is costing TSMC uh, 19.5 billion. And the total impact of Taiwan's ICT sector uh, from the section is 130 to 135 billion dollars for annual sales. Taiwan's fundamental economy is so ingrained in the global tech supply chain that we actually are on the uh, uh, receiving end of the impact. So in the parliament, there are one camp, there's one camp that's saying that we need to protect this sensitive technology. AI on chip, autonomous vehicles, the use of data, and all those sort of things. But where do we go in balancing the commercial interest as well as the national security? Uh, as someone who, who come from the uh, technology background, that, that's, a, that's a question that I am thinking very hard every day. 
And certainly, I met with tech entrepreneurs and even the, the chairman of this, uh, uh, all these uh, high-tech companies who've expressed their concern to me. For example, the trade war is going to slow down the standardization of 5G and uh, as well as slow down the development of the uh, technology. But if countries and the governments and the leaders, our politicians, are only thinking about ideologically, about their own self-interests, and not thinking about the development and advancement of the humanity, I think we are headed to a quite bad place. And technology is um, everything of it. So it's a hard question, and I'm dealing with it every day. I, I don't have an answer right now. But right now, we are, the only thing we could do is to secure the high-end section of the development of the critical technology for semiconductor, for AI on chip, for uh, biotechnology, oceanography, uh, development technology, that sort of things. Things that, are, that will eventually uh, help us protect our own democracy and sovereignty. So ladies and gentlemen, let us conclude on, uh, on uh, this challenge of the future. Huh? Nothing easy, the past hopefully will put behind public-private partnership has huge potential, also has huge challenges. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I think, <laughs> thank you. And I think Jason touched an important point to conclude is that it mustn't be ideological. And this is the great problem in parliaments is that it often becomes ideological and you stay pragmatic. Thank you very much. So time for another coffee break and we'll be back at 2.30. Thank you very much.